We'll get started. So good morning in Paris, good afternoon in Beijing, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Camille Payard. I work at the Renewable Integration and Secure Electricity Unit of the IEA, and I will be your host today. Thanks for joining online, either on Zoom or on the live streaming platform. Wherever you are in the world, we'll spend the next two hours together to discuss the fascinating topic of power markets reform in China and the rest of the world. But just a few housekeeping rules maybe before we get started. So this webinar is public and is being recorded. The recording will be available on the IEA website in the coming days. Um, as you can see, there is interpretation in English and Chinese available, so please select the English or Chinese channel at the bottom of your screen. And presenters can choose to speak either in Chinese or in English. In order to keep the sessions running on schedules and uh, hello questions from the audience, we would like to remind the presenters to please respect your allocated speaking time. And regarding the questions, we are planning to have a brief Q&A uh, in, uh, in each session, if the time allows. So feel free to submit your question during the webinar in the Q&A uh, chat box uh, on Zoom, and we'll uh, read them for you. And now let's get started, and I will let my colleague Pablo Eviacor introduce today's webinar. Pablo is the head of the Renewable Integration and Secure Electricity Unit here at the IEA. Prior to joining as the IEA, Pablo was working at the Danish Energy Agency for several years as the leader of the bilateral energy cooperation between Denmark and China. And therefore, I can tell you, has been following the China energy sector for many years and has been to China many times. So, Pablo, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Camille. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here and greetings from the International Energy Agency headquarters here in Paris. First of all, I'd like to start expressing our gratitude to the Rock IE Mountain Institute and the Electric Power Planning and Engineering Institute for co-hosting this event today with us. Our three organizations have been deeply engaged in monitoring the evolution of the power sector reforms in China, and I'm really delighted by this collaborative effort. I believe that our shared ambition is to contribute to the successful realization of China's new power system vision by providing in-depth analysis and actionable policy recommendations. Joining forces to facilitate knowledge sharing across borders can only be beneficial to achieve this goal. As we convene here today, let's briefly come back on some important events that have happened this summer. First of all, it is unfortunately impossible to ignore the scorching temperatures that reach historical records all over the globe, while some regions experience devastating fires and floods. In China, there were concerns about the grid's ability to handle soaring demand during heat waves. And these extreme weather events serve as a stark reminder of the urgent need to address the climate crisis and accelerate clean energy transitions. As you know, some regions in China count among the most vulnerable to climate change in the world today. Recognizing this urgency is not enough, and there's a pressing need to accelerate the transition to a future powered by renewable energy. These important changes require reforms of the current power system. Positive steps were taken over the summer. Let's note, for example, the Central Committee meeting held in July. Important new policies were announced to accelerate reforms of the power sector and the construction of a new Chinese power system, defined as low carbon, safe, coordinated, and flexible. In July also, our executive director, Fatih Birol, visited China for the first time since 2019. During this visit, the IA renewed its three-year work program with the National Energy Administration, NEA. Power market reforms and flexibility of power systems are some of the key areas of our collaboration, and we have exciting projects in the pipeline related to these topics. The Renewable Integration and Secure Electricity Unit of the IEA has already published analysis on the topic for several years. The latest one was released in April and is examining the role of power markets in China and the pathways to develop a unified system of markets at the national level. We paid particular attention to short-term markets for their potential to unlock the flexibility needed in power systems with a high proportion of wind and solar energy. Our analysis resulted in a set of policy recommendations that we had the opportunity to discuss with various Chinese stakeholders and policymakers. We strongly believe that the transition towards a modern power system will entail increased interprovincial trade, greater contractual flexibility, 
and improved institutional coordination. Of course, giving a stronger role to markets does not come without challenges and concerns. There is a need to accompany the transition with the right mechanisms and institutions to ensure that this transition is fair for consumers, existing assets, and new market entities. But China is not alone in this decarbonization journey. Around the globe, power markets are evolving to align with the country's climate goals, embracing structures that support renewables. The international community's collective experiences and knowledge sharing can serve as an inspiration for China as it pursues its journey of power market reform. Europe, in particular, can offer a relevant case study. Just this year, in response to the energy crisis, the European Commission proposed a revision of the European electricity market design. We will discuss later to what extent this reform can serve as a source of inspiration for China, and we will also present examples from Australia, a country also facing challenges similar to those observed in China. We're very honored to have a great panel of power sector experts participating in this event today, both in person and online, and we look forward to hearing your presentations and comments on the questions at hand. Two hours will, of course, not be enough to cover everything, but today's session is meant to foster an open discussion and brainstorming together on what power markets could look like in a net zero world. I look forward to the conversation today and to our continued cooperation with China to support its dual carbon goals, including achieving carbon neutrality before 2060. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you very much, Pablo, for this introduction and for the crazy stage. Uh, we'll start today's first session by an overview of the reform of the ele European electricity market design, which has attracted a lot of attention since uh, it was published by the European Commission in March, and for which the negotiation between the Council, the Parliament, and the Commission should be starting in September. Uh, for that, we have the great pleasure to have with us today in Paris, Professor Jean-Michel Glachon. Mr. Glachon is a professor at the Florence School of Regulation of the European University Institute, for which he was also the director for 15 years, if I'm correct. He, has also, he is also the president of the International Association for Energy Economics and vice president of the French Energy Economist Association. Uh, going through his full CV award, publication will take the whole time of the webinar, so I just wanted to highlight that Professor, Professor Glasson has been following with interest Chinese power market reform for many years. He has not only been the editor of the China edition of the excellent digest of the handbook on electricity markets, which I recommend everyone to read. So Mr. Glasson, we are very much looking forward to your presentation, um, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, once again, thanks, Camille. Ladies, gentlemen, and dear Chinese friends, a personal note, I am a friend of China since October 1967. It will make 56 years in a few days. And I am, of course, amazed of the incredible successes performed by your country. The topic today is the EU electricity market design reform. That's the way I will do it. First, to understand our reform, uh, you have to remember what are the basics of our market design, because we want to move from the existing design. Second, you have to remember why we want to move. We, we don't want to move for ourselves. We have to move because Russia, a former friend of the European Union, weaponized gas supply. We have an incredible gas shocks, and we have to adapt to these. And then we will see 12 pillars of the current proposal of reform. First, the basics of the current design, the design still playing today. First, it is light-handed. EU market design does not operate central dispatch for individual plants. The generators bid for all their portfolio of plants in a given zone of the EU market. Second, EU market design does not do nodal pricing, but zonal pricing. Therefore, the costs 
of intrazonal congestion, congestion in a zone, are socialized. Third, our EU market sets a marginal price paid to all builders needed to supply the load. Our EU marginal price corresponds to the most expensive plant needed to supply this load. Second, Europeanization of EU comes from rules. Or Europeanization is made by market coupling, the coupling of the basic units of pricing in EU, which are the zones. These many EU zones, about 40, are coupled by available transmission capacity guaranteed by the transmission system operators. When and where transmission capacity is set congested, the EU zones decouple. Third, very important, investment in renewable capacity is not built on EU market price. Most of the renewable investors receive a payment outside the EU wholesale market, a payment coming from national renewable support schemes. Our EU wholesale market does give economic incentives to select the marginal plant generating each half hour, but it does not drive capacity and technology adequacy. It's a very big feature. For investment in reliability adequacy is not built on EU market price. Renewables with low marginal costs are pushing out dispatchable technologies from the wholesale market equilibrium. Some transmission system operators can find too little dispatchable plants in a given zone portfolio and create for this zone a capacity remuneration mechanism to incentivize investors for such type of plant. We are going to finish soon. Five, carbon price. Very key because the carbon price links coal to gas in arbitrage via the electricity will sell pricing. EU carbon price, it's really EU. EU sets a quantity of carbon emission permits and a target of renewable generation. EU carbon permit traders anticipate a resulting carbon price. Plants generating with fossil fuels look at gas price versus coal price in the national fuels market fuel gas cost, sorry, fuel gas coal cost margin. The current carbon price in the EU carbon market, the carbon margin, and the wholesale marginal prices. That's the way the arbitrage coal to gas is done in the EU. You have seen that Ormacle design is really light. It is based on portfolio bidding by zones of marginal prices. The many zones of prices in the EU are coupled or decoupled according to transmission capacity guaranteed by the many, the many transmission system operators. The definition of these EU zones are controlled by national authority. For example, France and Germany have each only one zone, while Sweden has four, Norway six. You see that the number of zones does not correspond to the size of the country, quasi the opposite. EU will sell pricing is very powerful as incentive to select each half hour the marginal plant among dispatchable plants, but does not control carbon price to arbitrage between coal and gas, does not play the key role to finance renewable investors or reliability adequacy investors. 
Why did we quit? Why are we quitting this market design? You will see that it's not a will, it's mainly a reaction to something. That's in blue electricity price, in brown gas price. Last year, you see that the cheapest gas we can get by megawatt hour was 75 euro. The most expensive, let's say 300 euro a megawatt hour. You have to remember that in the year 2019, the highest weekly price we got for gas was 25 euro. So the price of gas has tripled when it was not so expensive last year or has been multiplied by 12, 1,200% increase. And price of electricity is a double of this because we need two megawatt hour of gas for one megawatt hour of electricity. Now you understand the crisis we face and it is also an energy general crisis because Russia was our first supplier for gas, first for oil, first for coal, first for uranium fuel. We were deeply linked to Russia. As long as we are friendly, fine. If we fight catastrophe, we have to change the way we price electricity. That's the current reform of the EU market design. It's a reaction to the weaponization of gas in Russia. I know that in China, you do not care. We, you have friendly relations with Russia, like India and other countries. But we in EU, uh, it's not our case. Commission authorized all emergency measures to quickly react to this incredible jump into electricity prices. Commission authorized capping wholesale prices capping retail prices, giving direct subsidies, storing price surge in a consumer debt, taxing energy companies' profits. You can do everything you want, but it is provisional. This summer, this has been stopped. Therefore, the head of the European Union, being not the Commission, asked Commission to produce something permanent, a permanent market design reform, not, not for emergency, forever. The e Commission is not the head of the state of the Union. The political head is the European Council, but they have no time to explain why. Commission issued a reform proposal the 14th of March. It is a proposal. It has to be voted by the Parliament and the Senate. But the Senate is Europe is a Council of Member States Ministers. There is three axes in the EU Commission reform proposals. First, to protect consumers from fossil fuel volatile prices. You see that consequence of the wholesale price for consumers. Second, to support stability and previsibility of energy prices and protect EU competitiveness is to protect from wholesale prices the whole economy. Prices, prices, at the goal. We react to a, a price in enormous crisis. And third, accelerate investments in renewable energy. You remember that renewable energy is not financed by the wholesale pricing, but as we are using renewable to consume less gas, the more we invest in renewable, the less gas we will consume. You see that the three axes aim at changing the market outcomes by changing the rules. First axe, to protect consumers from volatile prices. First, each European consumer will have the right to get either a fixed price contract, a dynamic price contract, which means a contract aligned with the wholesale marginal price, or to have multiple contracts as one for my electric vehicle, one for my heat pump, for example. Second, when a new EU electric crisis will be identified, each country will be authorized to block the prices or to regulate them. Third, energy sharing. 
right for the prosumers. We call prosumers an individual renewable producer. It can be me, it can be a restaurant, it can be a community, etc. All these prosumers, individual generators, will have the right to share their own generation with other consumers. They will have the right to bypass the suppliers. Four, edging will be made mandatory for all suppliers and last resort suppliers serving protected consumers. These suppliers will be prohibited to align only on the wholesale market price. They will have to buy edging. It's a lot of changes. Eh? Second, other changes for the whole economy. First, governments will have to support PPA. PPA are power purchase agreements. They are individual private contracts. Private contracts will have to receive public guarantees against their own risks. These risks, these risks are the buyer not paying or the seller not delivering which is typical in a bilateral contract. In this case, a, a state authority will pay for the damages and therefore it will be less risky to sell or to buy with a PPA and easier to get a bank support to enter into it. On the top, governments will have to welcome private contracting PPAs in the public calls for tenders. A lot of changes. Two, governments or public authorities, depends, eh? will have to use two ways CFDs. A CFD is a contract for difference. It is a financial contract. A PPA is a contract for supply, for delivery. CFD is only financial. A contract about what? It's a contract about the wholesale price. A buyer and a seller will agree on a reference price guaranteed by them. When the wholesale price is too low, the seller will be paid on the top of the wholesale price by the buyer. It is too high, so when the wholesale price is too high, like we have seen in Germany last week, 500 euro a megawatt hour, when the wholesale price is too high, the seller is giving the excess money to the buyer. It stabilizes prices across crisis for years. Second, commission would like the excess funds collected by public authorities, by CFDs, to benefit to consumers proportional to their consumption. Third, commission would like public authorities to create regional virtual hubs. You remember that the European market is made of zones. Commission would like to have regional hubs on the top of the zones. To do what? To have long-term trade. And to help this, Commission would permit to book cross-border capacity for more than one year. For very powerful to authorize transmission system operators, the grid operators, to prepare peak shaving tools able to limit price spikes. So the system operators will intervene into the market to limit price spikes. Third, to accelerate investments. First, uh, Public authority will have to ease the financing of new renewable investment with long-term contracts. We have seen why PPAs and CFDs can help investors to enter. Second, Commission would allow to create, would allow the TSO or the public authorities to create capacity mechanisms to increase low carbon flexibility. The idea is that storage or demand response can substitute to supply, to consume less or to deliver while not generating. 
And the Commission will permit public authorities to create new support schemes for this type of assets, assets delivering flexibility. Third, Commission would ask each country to undertake national flexibility needs assessment with indicative targets of building these assets and to include this into the plans, the national plans sent to European Commission, because in Europe, the targets are pan-European, but the delivery, the implementation is national. The link between national implementation and European target are these plans. And for increased transparency about grid connection capacity, it is something we should have already, but it is added there. I remember you that there are proposals. They have to be voted by EU Parliament and Council of Ministers. Parliament voted 19th of July and yesterday at midnight. I do not know the result yet. We will see how Parliament negotiates with Council. Council has not formalized its will. If both chambers agree, they also have to come back to Commission because Commission can veto what they decide. We call it trilog. Usually, the rotating European presidency plays a role. Spain this semester, Belgium next semester. But this semester, Spain is not playing a big role. As uh, Camille said, we have made a summary, uh, a, a deep uh, digest of our handbook in 70 pages. It is free access at EU China Energy Cooperation Platform, thanks to them. And uh, good, good, good lecture to all of you, PDF, Kindle ebook. If you want to know more about Europe, electricity markets and network regulation. If you want to have all the details, we have uh, 50 to 100 policy briefs, energy articles, technical reports at our school. To keep a link with me, Twitter, LinkedIn, website, and as Camille said, I am the world president at AEE. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Glachon. I know it was a very complex task to summarize in a simple way and in such a short time, both the current EU power market design and the proposed reform. So I think you, you really did it brilliantly. Um, I don't see any question at this stage on the chat, but uh, Professor Glachon will stay with us later during the discussion, as uh, during the panel discussion at the end. So feel free to leave your question in the Q&A box for later. Uh, no, now, if you may, let's move uh, from Europe to China with a presentation on the latest trends in new energy development and new energy participation in power markets in China. Uh, just to note that the concept of new energy in China typically refers to the non-hydro renewables. So for this presentation, I welcome Dr. Li Zhong from China EPPEI. Dr. Li Zhong is currently Deputy Director of Market Research Division within the Energy Policy and Market Research Institute. He has been working for many years on energy and power planning, energy policies, power and carbon market, and he has led and was engaged in dozens of projects interested by the NDRC, the NEA, local governments, and energy utilities. So Mr. Li Zhong, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues from IEA. So I am Li Rong from the EPPEI. Today I'm going to explore with you uh, China's new energy power markets and green certification. So my presentation today will be divided into three parts. The first part will be talking about situation of China's new energy development. The second part, I'll be talking about observations on China's new energy market. This is also my focus of today. 
The third part is going to be about new requirements for green certification, some latest development. So the first, for the first part, new situation of China's new energy development. New energy in China, excuse me. Okay, uh, new energy, uh, the scale and development of new energy in China is among the top in the world. With benchmark tariffs and guaranteed purchase system, promote development of new energy and growing grid connected install capacity. You can see that from 2010, we have an annual growth average to 23.3%. And on the right chart, we see that's the installed solar capacity with annual growth of 61.5%. And you can see that by the end of 2021, China's install capacity of renewables Wind power, solar power all accounted for more than one third of the global install capacity. And then you can see hydroelectricity and so capacity accounted for 29% of the global total. By the end of 2021, China's new energy and so capacity reached 234 gigawatts, accounting for 27%. And new energy power generation now accounts for 13.7% of total consumption. So today, we have uh, laws and um, reno renewable laws regulation. This is the basis, renewable energy law. And we have uh, industry policy, supervision, and standardized system. However, today, uh, we still face some difficulties or uncertainties in terms of um, how to make it more flexible how to regulate it in a more flexible way. First of all, because the instability of new energy, uh, we need, we are working for, we need a, we, today we have a higher requirements for system flexibility. Also, we see that foundation of consumption is not yet solid and the problem of curtailment is still prominent. Construction of regulating resources faces many constraints and the risk of efficient regional consumption of new energy has increased. So those are some of the difficulties and uncertainties we're facing today. And now the second part, some of the observations on China's new energy market. These are some of the markets we have. The first is generation priority and power purchase. We talk about uh, generation power purchase priority. They can purchase at a government price. And the second mid and long-term power trade, there's one for inter-provincial market and intra-provincial market. And the third type, uh, short-term within months, there's also it's, uh, generation right transactions between uh, thermal and thermal plants, thermal hydro plants, etc. The next one, ancillary services. There's also inter-provincial markets and intra-provincial markets. And the last one, pilot spot markets in Shanxi, Gansu, Guangdong, and Fujian. They have uh, run long cycle pilot uh, spot markets. So uh, modalities for new energy in provincial spot markets. Uh, pilot spot markets have conducted preliminary exploration of the trading mechanism for new energy participation in the market. You can see from the chart, from this table, Shanxi, Gansu, Guangxi, and Shandong, they have they all have high install room renewables install capacity, more than 30%. New energy accounts for over 30% of install capacity and 15% of power generation. So there's several, again, modalities. Um, first one is quotation offer, bidding on the same platform with conventional power supply, settlement of power according to the spot price. 
and the second one, uh, declare quantity not quoted. Declare quantity of electricity is prioritized for clearing as the price taker settles according to the spot price. And the third one, uh, non-participation as a market boundary conditions settle at the approved price. So these are still evolving, these rules and modalities of participation. And today, modalities for new energy in interprovincial and interregional markets, uh, medium and long markets, and a uh, spot market. Medium and long market, including new energy export, direct transactions between generator and large users, and interprovincial power generation right transactions. So for spot markets, uh, it started in, it was launched in 2017. And in 2021, uh, there's an interprovincial spot trading rules. It was, uh, the rules were approved. In addition, uh, it can only, new energy can also participate in green power market. This is a way for um, the, this is a mid medium long-term transaction. This is also a unification of new energy power and green certificates. So we believe that this is an inevitable trend for new energy to participate in the power market. And it's also an important mission for us to make it happen. First of all, uh, it's in of inevitable requirements for building new power system because new energy will gradually become main power source of China's power system. Uh, to build a power market system adaptive to the new power, um, the, this new um, power mix, we have to adapt accordingly. With new energy in the market, new energy will be competing with conventional energy sources. And also we have to utilize advantages of renewable energy sources in terms of low power generation cost and strong regulation capability of traditional power sources to tap potential of demand side response. However, we still face some challenges today for new energy to participate in the power market. First of all, it's because of uh, the characteristics of new energy. So it's difficult to have a high price in spot market. The average, uh, the average price of new energy is still lower than conventional energy, um, conventional energy. Um, in addition, today the market still needs to be improved even though we have set up the basic structure of the market however we still see that it's still not present enough in the medium to long-term market also for interprovincial and interregional transaction we still face some barriers but because of that we believe that there are some of the recommendations. These are some of the recommendations we have. The first is to improve the power market mechanism, promote convergence of medium and long-term and spot markets, gradually liberalize the restrictions on proportion of power traded in medium and long-term. Uh, in some provinces, they still have some restrictions in this regard. The second recommendation is to improve mechanism for sharing auxiliary service cost on the user side. The third recommendation is breaking down some of the barriers. Uh, the second area is to con uh, promote convergence of carbon green certificate and electricity market. Top level design in terms of linking and synergizing carbon market, green certificate market, and power market. Open up uh, betting points of policy convergence. And then the third area, guiding businesses or individuals to green power consumption, encourage people to use uh, green electricity, promote shift from dual control of energy consumption to dual control of carbon emissions, establish carbon quota share and carbon market trading mechanisms, increasing production and trading costs of high carbon power sources. 
So because a uh, green certification is a way to show value of uh, renewable energy, of new energy. Uh, recently, we have some new requirements for green certification. Green certificate refers to the Renewable Energy Green Power Certificate, which is the uh, electronic ID card of renewable power. Um, it is uh, innovations to improve policy supporting green development, the only proof of the environmental value of renewable energy. It is also and supporting an important supporting role to encourage green consumption. So now the green certification is issued by the NEA, so it has authority. And then uniqueness, this is only proof of the environmental attributes of renewable power. And the third, versatility, clarify the fundamental role of green certificates in supporting green power trading and consumption. And the issuing authority is uh, national, the National Energy Administration, and it is um, it has a big coverage, uh, issuing green certificates for all electricity generated by nationally registered renewable energy power generation projects. So it's from uh, wind power, solar power, hydroelectric, biomass, geopower, uh, geothermal power, and uh, also other power sources. So there's a cross-reference between uh, power generated, power output, and power consumption. So there are several platforms. Uh, in the Beijing and Guangzhou Power Exchange Center, and also the uh, methods. There's bilateral negotiation, listing or centralized bidding. With the green certificates, it can be used in different scenarios. First of all, I can support green power trading. Green certificates are transferred from the issuing authority to the electricity trading institutions and traded with green electricity. So this is an, a, a good way to improve synergy of different systems. And then they can also uh, encourage renewable energy consumption and also certify green power consumption. Also, something important is that it can connect carbon markets, advance the linkage mechanism between green certificates, carbon emissions trading, and greenhouse gas reduction trading. And then the last point is that it can be internationally recognized as a green certificate. So this is just a brief introduction, and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, my colleagues from the IEA. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee, for this excellent presentation. I noticed that in your presentation, you started raising some uh, intelligences and challenges that new energy can face in participating in existing power markets in China and uh, needed related improvements. So I hope this is something we can discuss further uh, during our panel um, later, later on. So now I suggest uh, we can check if there are some questions. Um, a question I, I see from uh, Nicola Fatras. Uh, thank you for your presentation. In your opinion, what could encourage market participants to transition from mid, mid to long term markets to spot markets apart from market design? So, Dr. Lejean, if you have um, uh, some comments on this question. Uh, here is my understanding for renewables to participate, to be encouraged to participate more. First of all, the renewable market, when we talk about, for example, incentive rules, if renewables want to participate in certain market, 
there are regulations telling us who and how you can participate. And for middle and long term participation, it depends on the regulations, local re or regional regulations. In some places, we have limits, unfortunately, for renewables to participate in the market. But personally, I think we should open up for renewables. We should let market entities to decide according to their capacity to decide how they want to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lijon. I see another question, um, but it's written in Chinese, so I will just <laughs> wait for a quick translation, if possible. Um, so another question, as part of the reforms to integrate renewable energy into the electricity market, what does the push for ancillary cost to be charged by the customer side mean for renewable energy users and investors? I think you should be able to read the question in Chinese uh, in the chat box if it's easier to understand for you. Um, so, in terms of encouragement to consumers to use renewables, for a long time, we consider this very important part of our policy design. In the past, very few people want to use renewables because the market, the downstream market was not capable. So today what we need to do is to make the market more capable and let companies, for example, who want to use renewables to reduce carbon emission, to feel that it is good for them, it is profitable for them to use renewables. That's what we are thinking. And in terms of investors, I think we need to have better ways to let renewables to enter the market. For example, for ancillary services, we should let them have a better way to pay certain contributions or certain fees so that investors will be more encouraged to do so. Thank you. Thank you, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So there was one on the green, green certificates. Uh, will China allow multiple transaction of green energy certificates in the future? Honestly, that depends. Personally, I don't know for the moment being. However, I think in the near future, no, we won't be doing this because green certification is something new. So there are a lot of things to settle, to be settled now. The whole system, we're working on the whole system, so we need to come make it comprehensive first and then think of multi-transaction. That's my personal point of view. Thank you, that's uh, already very helpful to know. And we have uh, um, a more detailed question from uh, Sharon Feng. Um, 
I don't know if you have an insight on that, but she is asking, can you share with us the estimation on the cost for ancillary services that renewable projects need to bear in 2030? So quite a <laughs> precise question, but if you have uh, any trends or idea on the ancillary services cost. This one is from Sharon Frang. And this one was written in, uh, in English yes. in the chat box. I'm, I'm sorry, it's the interpreter. Could you please read it a little bit slower, please? The, the question. Hello? Uh, I will just repeat the question slower. Thank you. Can you share with us the estimation on the cost for ancillary services that renewable projects need to bear in 2030? So, Uh, I'm sorry, but first, it's very difficult to estimate that. And secondly, I'm not sure if I understand well the acceleration of renewables, the cost of acceleration of renewables. Yeah, it was ancillary services, but I think I suggest... Um... You can come back directly to, to Sharon after the presentation, maybe because now for the, I think I, we, Okay, I understand it better now. Um, but sorry, I don't, I can't really estimate the cost, but by 2030, we won't know if it will be the customers to pay for it or it will be distributed like today. So if we don't know that, we can't really estimate the cost for 2030. Thank you so much, Dr. I see there are still a few more questions, but for the sake of time, I think we'll move to the next session, but feel free to directly type an answer in the chat box if you prefer. So now we'll move to the next session, which focuses on how to use distributed energy resources as flexible resources in the power markets with the case of virtual power plants. As you may know, the Chinese government is now promoting virtual power plants, or let's call that VPPs, uh, at, the highest, at the highest level uh, for the critical roles they can play to provide flexible demand response. That's why we found it would be interesting to start the session by an overview of the situation of VPPs in China before having an example on the benefits of uh, VPPs, uh, the benefits that they can offer in a more developed and integrated power markets, but also the challenges they currently face with the example of Australia afterward. So for the Chinese side, I uh, first welcome Dr. Fei Xiangbong, who is currently working as a senior engineer at the China Electric Power Research Institute. He has long been engaged in the research work on big data analysis of power distribution, smart power consumption, demand side coordination and optimization, and also he has also extensive experience in the field of uh, demand response, of course, and uh, virtual power plants. So please, Mr. Gong, the floor is yours uh, for the next 10 minutes. And yeah, see, we can see your slides perfectly. Thank you. Dear experts, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation from uh, IEA and uh, IRMI. My name is Gong Fei Xiang. I come from China Electricity Power Research Institute. It's blocked. Uh, 
We turned off your camera, but I, we can still see your slides. Yeah, uh, Dr. Fashion Hong, we can't hear you right now, but we'll still see that you are online. So maybe we can try to wait a few more minutes, otherwise we can just simply switch the order of the presentation. No worry. So maybe, um, Mr. Kong, while you're fixing this uh, issue, we can uh, have uh, the presentation by Mrs. Gabrielle Creeper uh, first. So you can stop uh, sharing your screen. And um, we'll start, it's, it's fine, we'll start uh, on the Australian side. So um, if you don't mind, Mrs. Gabrielle Creeper, uh, we'll have... Uh, we'll give uh, today the, the Australian perspective on uh, virtual power plants. Just as a brief introduction, Dr. Creeper is currently working in Australia on policy and regulation to support distributed energy resources, including as a guest contributor with the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. She's a great specialist in this in distributed energy resources with many publications on the topic and has over 20 years of experience in the corporate world, government and non-government organization and academia. So Mrs. Cooper, uh, please, the floor is yours if you with us. Thanks very much, Cecile, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone from Sydney, Australia. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you a perspective from Australia and to be part of this esteemed panel. Australia's national electricity market covers its east coast with a wholesale market that dispatches not in 30 minutes like in Europe, um, as Professor Glashant um, described, but actually now in five minute increments. It has a price ceiling of about 16,000 Australian dollars, and it also has a negative price floor. So at times you have to pay to generate into the market, and that's as, up to as much as $1,000 Australian per megawatt hour. And because of the significant amount of renewables coming into our electricity market, especially with solar in the middle of the day, those negative price intervals are increasing as this graph shows. So distributed energy resources, um, that's both behind the meter, rooftop solar, battery storage, uh, appliances which are flexible in their demand, um, electric vehicles potentially, um, and distributed energy resources in the distribution system, such as network level batteries, are made a huge impact on the energy market in Australia. 
we now have over 3 million households with solar on their roofs. So in some states, particularly Queensland and South Australia, they now have over 40% of homes with solar on them. We've also got accelerating take up of rooftop solar by businesses and other community organisations. Um, but most of those commercial and industrial scale solar systems are still relatively small, so less than like five megawatts, but there's huge potential um, for larger scale systems. There's only a relatively small number of behind the meter batteries in the system at the moment. That's primarily because of their relatively high cost. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that Australia has done really badly is so far is to underutilize demand response. So we have a demand response mechanism in our wholesale market, but currently there's only about 60 megawatts of commercial and industrial demand that's participating in that market. However, despite um, all of these trends in the uptake in distributed energy resources, their benefits have still been underestimated. To give you a sense of where we're heading, our energy market operator, AEMO, has committed to running the Australian national energy market with 100% instantaneous. So in our case, that means five minute increments of renewables by 2025. So within two years. In fact, we're already seeing the South Australian state producing over 100% renewables. So right. last week, um, it was exporting um, more renewable energy than it was producing. So it was producing 120% renewable supply and exporting a lot of that to the neighbouring state of South Australia. Um, where we're heading overall in terms of the national electricity market is um, to 82% renewables by 2030. That's our national government target. You'll see we're just over a third of supply at the moment from wind and solar and hydro. And um, so there's a lot of ramping up of um, deployment of renewables that needs to happen within the next seven years. So to talk about how best to integrate distributed energy resources, while this session today is all about markets, we need to talk first and foremost about getting the technical settings right to enable the markets to work most effectively. One of the things that's been done in Australia is the development of this idea of dynamic operating export um, envelopes or flexible exports. So previously, if you had solar on your roof, you would only be able to import or export to a maximum of five kilowatts. However, the South Australian Power Network, or SAPN, has developed this concept of flexible exports, whereby the amount you can export or import at any time changes on one to five minute intervals, set usually 24 hours in advance. And in this case, um, we have they have been able to increase the export limit from a static five kilowatts up to 10 kilowatts, 98% of the time. So of course, if you're a household um, or a business with seven, eight, nine, 10 kilowatts of capacity, previously, a lot of that capacity has been constrained unless you're able to use it um, on the premises. Now with these, um, flexible exports, you'll be able to have much more of that capacity available to potentially participate in markets. So that's why I say it's very important to get the technical right um, as a basis for making the markets work effectively. Virtual power plants, um, my Chinese colleague would no doubt have explained this for anyone that's unfamiliar, that's when you take a whole variety of behind the meter resources and you aggregate them using smart software to be able to participate in a variety of markets. And that participation can be on the generation side 
or in terms of demand response um, or ancillary services, or as I'll discuss um, in terms of providing network services. So I prepared a report for the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis on the state of virtual power plants in Australia last week, and last week, last year, feels like last week. One of the key findings around that was to look at how the trials of virtual power plants that were run by the market operator, uh, what the results of those were. And they showed that in fact, all of these resources could be aggregated to provide all of the market um, participation that I just mentioned, but not without challenges, particularly in terms of forecasting. So there were uh, challenges in the reliability of virtual power plants at this early stage, um, particularly things like home internet connections dropping out, um, and potentially user overrides and also um, responsiveness of the technology. Those are all the sort of challenges that you would expect at this early stage. Um, and there's a whole variety of things that are needed from the market operator's point of view to make virtual power plants work more effectively. However, not only have we had trials of virtual power plants, what was fascinating when I wrote the report was to find out how many commercially available virtual power plants uh, were being offered to households and businesses in the Australian market. And when you looked at those offers, it was fascinating how many there were because the revenue is not necessarily there. So there are new sources of revenue needed for um, those virtual power plants to be financially viable in the longer term. Particularly, I mentioned our demand response mechanism only allows large scale commercial and industrial participation. It needs to allow aggregated household participation um, to provide that revenue stream. And we also don't have a standard method for allowing payments for distribution network services. Um, the UK, for example, has done this a lot better to date. So my conclusion was it's why these all of these companies were investing in virtual power plants was because um, while the margins were currently thin, obviously the revenue from... Uh, providing electricity to homes and businesses is decreasing as they adopt solar and become more efficient and look at things like behind the meter batteries. And uh, so what they re realized was in order to be profitable into the future, they were going to need to harness all of these fleets of behind the meter resources. And in fact, as I was completing the report, Origin Energy, one of our big three generator retailers, made an announcement that they were going to increase the size of their virtual power plant from 205 megawatts up to 2000 megawatts in just four years. So they see the opportunity there. Going to give you one significant graph um, to look at, which is to understand really the significant, the potential significance if we get the policy regulation and markets right of distributed energy resources. I worked with ITP Renewables to do backcasting modeling about what the future of saturation distributed energy resources might look like. So when every rooftop in Australia that can have solar, has solar, when we have batteries, when we have electric vehicles, we looked at a whole range of scenarios. The pink duck you see is rooftop solar only. The orange duck is what happens when you add batteries. So the evening peak decreases because the battery is soaking up some of the solar electricity produced by the panels during the day and making that available in the household in the evening. Then if you allow the batteries to trade, that evening peak disappears uh, entirely. So 
the wholesale market prices where revenue is highly dependent on that evening peak should fall and also network prices so network peaks should also fall because you get a similar kind of impact there uh, obviously there's a whole lot of ifs and buts and a whole lot of things we need to do to ensure these positive outcomes which um, should ensure um, more efficient use of the grid and reduced wholesale peaks um, they also these changes should also alleviate the minimum demand challenges so the negative pricing issue that's um, happening during the middle of the day and also uh, we have challenges with ramping up to the evening peak in the um, at the moment with the nature of the duck curve currently so to summarize the things that are needed to make markets work for distributed energy resources are to put those dynamic operating envelopes and the technical specifications in place. Um, also provide open and transparent information on network constraints, um, something that was also um, mentioned by the professor earlier. Um, I haven't managed to talk about my favorite topic of um, EV charging and vehicle to home and vehicle to grid, but there's huge potential there. Then we need to make it easy to allow virtual power plants to participate in wholesale demand response and ancillary services markets. And also finally, allowing DER to in aggregate through virtual power plants to provide network services. That could be through real-time pricing or auctions or other methods. So thank you very much for your attention and I very much look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for this excellent presentation on the Australian case. Uh, I really liked uh, the little colourful duck curves you showed us, and uh, really appreciated uh, you being flexible to present first. And also looking forward to uh, dis to hear more from the EOR in the panel discussion. So now I see we have um, uh, Fei Xiang back online. So. Uh, let's try again uh, to have the to have now the Chinese perspective on the virtual power plants. If you can um, try, yeah, we can see your screen now. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. As I was saying earlier. So there are several policies uh, implemented uh, in regard of VPP. For now, we still have uh, no national level policies, but there are provincial level uh, specialized policy in uh, Shanxi, Shanghai, Guangdong. These policies re in re is, are in regard of the design, the transaction, and financial support of these VPPs. And in terms of market mechanisms, we're also having a basic framework of market mechanism. So below is a very simple timeline. Uh, in the very beginning, we had exchanges with Spanish and German experts. In the very beginning, there was a uh, demo project in Shanghai Huangpu district. And so in 2017, the demo uh, project is uh, gathered together commercial building. It's a commercial building based VPP. In 2019, we have also a new project in Guowang Xibei company. And we, our goal was to have a high sensible re, uh, network. In 2020, in Shanghai, we have created VPP based on a aggregation of buildings. And then the next year, we also developed national important pilot development program on VPP, and most recently, VPP was included in the 14th five-year plan. And we have created 
several new projects on this subject. And what interests most people is how we are going to have benefits. Uh, firstly, we could have primary sources of revenue. We also need the VPPs to have peak of peak uh, arbitrage capacities. Also, we need to provide trust or custody services for customers, and we can gain profits from these services. For the moment being, most of these projects, VPP projects, are pilot projects. And in terms of regulations or standards, they are in um, development. And we try to have better standards or more precise standards for storage and distributed resources, among others. And there are many pilot constructions, like in Guangdong, Hebei. And that there are a few cases that we would like to present. For example, we have a new Guangdong province market-based demand response implementation rule, rules which stipulates the regulation capacity and the demand response mechanism for VPP. In Shenzhen, we have a three-year plan from 2022 to 2025. We would like to have a VPP base uh, mostly for electric, electric cars. Of course, we also need to make more progress to have a more comprehensive trading mechanism. And where are the benefits coming, uh, incentives coming from? We have, first of all, the province that will give, uh, the government will give subsidies. The city of Shenzhen will also fix certain incentives. And thirdly, we have uh, the grid of the South that will give subsidies. For the moment being, we have already included some aggregators, 12 aggregators in our platform. Why choosing Shenzhen for the pilot project? Because this platform have several advantages. This VPP is a bit like foreign VPPs. It combines the different resources and break certain silos that existed before. And it's also a closed cycle. Besides, it's very flexible. It has a very good capacity of coding. The result. First, we can provide services directly to participant companies. For example, we have water treatment companies that can benefit from the platform. And we can regulate to a load of three megawatts. Secondly, for the aggregated resources, 
because we have seven aggregators, we could mobilize lots of resources. And thirdly, we could have a very rapid response. So on the industrial side, in very little time, we could have very rapid response to regulate. Because of the time, I just give you a very brief presentation of this case. And uh, in terms of control, in Tibet, VPP, there are rather an aggregation of uh, industrial buildings, while as in Shanghai, it's an aggregation of uh, commercial buildings. And we also made a comparison between China and uh, foreign countries. We have seen that, for example, in terms of um, market maturity abroad, the VPPs are way more developed than in China. For example, in the USA, in the year of 20, uh, 2005 and 2006, they already have developed the VPP. They have better technologies too. And for business mode, in terms of ancillary services or peak shaving services, China still need to find a clearer business mode. There are only some pilot projects. So after the comparison, we realized that for the VPP to participate in market trading, we need to make sure that everyone benefits from it. We have good policies that encourages us to do so. And uh, many mm, state-owned big power companies are trying pilot VPPs. And we hope that when there are a huge demand for power, we could well use VPP to help us. And as I said, it's included, VPP is included in our 14th five-year plan. Yes, we do need a, a policy support. And um, when it comes to VPP demand and resource supply, in Shanghai, Beijing, Hangzhou, especially in summer or in winter, when we have huge needs of power, when we can have an aggregation of buildings it could really help us to ease the problem of energy demand. Secondly, we also need to take into consideration the specificity of industrial development in China. There are energy intensive industries And we need to match these industries to the area where uh, the area rich in solar and wind power. We have made some research, like in Dongbei, in Anshan. It is already the case. We try to match the industry to the natural resources. And this is the model we really want to deploy in scale. And thirdly, when it comes to consumption of... Mr. Gong, I will ask you to conclude soon because we are running a bit late. So if possible to, to give a short conclusion at least. Fourthly, we need to meet the demands of the consumers. 
in the future, we found several potentials like uh, VPP in the cities, uh, VPPs for, sha uh, for peak shaving and for uh, consumption of local needs. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that was perfect. So, yeah, we can really tell based on your presentation that uh, virtual porn prints are a very fast evolving sector in China. I think it's really interesting to see how some provinces are progressing to run pilots to integrate them to the spot markets, but uh, doing that at different paces. So now for the panel discussion, we'll reconvene all our invited speakers and I'll pass over to Mrs. Yujing Liu to moderate this session. Uh, Yujing is a principal of uh, Rocky Mountain Institute China program and she's leading the power decarbonization work of the organization focusing on national, regional and provincial power sector decarbonization pathways from different perspectives such as power market design, coal transition and increasing the penetration of renewable energy. So Yujing, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penny. Can you hear me well? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thank yeah, you. Um, oh, I would like to invite all the participants to open their camera, to turn on their cameras. So, please. And um, Ms. Jiang Liping included she is the third level consultant and former vice president of state great uh, great energy research institute please all turn on your right now we have heard the wonderful presentations and we see that in different places there are different changes in china we talk about uh, unified system for by the year of 2030. In Europe, we talk about also energy market transition. And we also have different uh, net zero goals. So to start, I have a question. I would like to ask all of you to answer the question. So given your country or your region's long-term power decarbonization goals, Already, the current power market mechanism, mechanism is to achieve those goals. Uh, if you can rate from 1 to 10, what are, why do you rate a certain, give a certain rate, and what are the missing elements? So let's start from Ms. Jiang. Maybe Ms. Chiang is not there. So maybe we can start with Dr. Lee. All right. So you want to know how ready the current power market mechanism is to achieve our goals. To my personal point of view, from one to 10, I'll give, I'll give a five. I think that is the current level because now the power market, the market mechanism is not yet mature. So from the market perspective, some provinces have already their pilot markets. Uh, all provinces have ancillary service markets, but only in some provinces have spot market. So our next step, we want to have a unified power system. It still, it'll still take a few years. On the other hand, we, Tony has proposed to construct a unified uh, power market. This is uh our big direction our goal but how to do it what is the pathway toward a unified market it is still something we should be working on also another point is that the new market 
should be able to accommodate a uh, new energy. And what are some of the requirements? What do we, uh, how, how should we design a market in order to accommodate new energy? For now, we still lack consensus. So that's why I give a five. Thank you very much. So for Ms. Jiang, what do you think? I cannot hear your voice, Ms. Jiang. No, still no sound from your side. Do you want to? Okay. Uh, Do you want me to? Do you want me to evaluate the European market design? Okay. You remember that we have to face this enormous shock with gas prices regarding this shock we have not yet done halfway and even the reform conceived by european commission even fully implemented is not fully answering the shock because we have to substitute renewables to gas and we use an enormous amount of gas. So if I have to evaluate, I will say only three on the scale of 10. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so yeah. now, um, Mr. Stupu, Gabby, yeah, what's thank your view? I may be overly generous, but I would give Australia about six out of 10. Um, one of the reasons is that I think our wholesale market is working well. Uh, renewables are cheaper and they are displacing fossil fuels. And the change in the market from 30 minute to five minute settlement has obviously assisted that. And I think that's part of the overall turning upside down of market design that needs to happen with the change from fossil fuels to renewables. I think the way I think about it is that we've had sort of static um, supply that has raised and lowered to meet demand. Now we've got variable sources of supply that are dependent on the weather and we need our demand to rise and fall to meet the available supply. Obviously, um, the more storage you have in the system, the less you have to flex the demand. But the reason I wouldn't give Australia a higher rating than six is that we're still in the very early stages of learning how to flex our demand. As I said, our demand response mechanism is very, very small and our distributed energy resource integration is still at very early stages. Um, and there are big opportunities, one of them that I wanted to highlight that I think is possibly relevant to China as well as Europe and elsewhere is gas hot water systems. So we have a lot of those for residential and for commercial and industrial in Australia. The number for Australia, if you were to electrify all of the residential hot water systems and make them smart using heat pumps so that they could be flexible demand, is 22 gigawatts, um, which is roughly a third of our market capacity. So I think there's huge potential with smart electrification um, and the appropriate market design to get the demand to be more flexible to match these variable sources of supply. Okay, okay, thank you. Great. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Clearly. It's difficult to give uh, a score. So I agree with what uh, uh, Professor Lee said. I also give it a five because we know that uh, there's no perfect solution. There's only a better solution and the solution will be constantly evolving. So when we're promoting market reform, 
what I feel is that we need to have more exchange. Actually, there are some good practices in some provinces in China, but if we can have more occasions for discussion, for exchange, we can together find a better solution. Another point I'd like to mention is that uh, in the power markets, there are a lot of products. If we want to achieve the dual carbon goals, the market is still insufficient to help us to achieve these goals. Also, I mentioned product design. Actually, we still need to improve our products in the current Chinese market. I heard uh, Professor Glachon mentioned that uh, in terms of adequacy, Adequacy is a concept that's discussed in Europe. I believe we should also do that in China. My third point is that I think government and market, between government and market, there still be more collaboration and should be playing uh, roles, complementary roles. When markets cannot uh, when market is insufficient, and government should help. Should we cap the price or not? I heard that in Europe, there's also policies of capping the price. And also I heard the concepts of green certification and uh, green certificates and how we can link green certificates with the power market. And also, we have to learn, our government has to learn how to give more space for the market, for the market to work on itself. And so how about Professor Gong? So for me, I will, from the demand side or from the user's perspective, I'll give us six out of 10. So we see some new policies being published in regard um, in regard of uh, new energy and in regard of the power market, uh, placing new energy uh, as the central role in the power market. We know that uh, macroly speaking, we have met all the requirements from the load side. However, we know that mechanisms still need to be improved I believe VPP, VPP is a solution. VPP, uh, its business model uh, proved that it can make profits. Some VPPs, they can also make profit by imbalanced trading. Also, VPP, what it needs is a stable revenue so then a VPP ecosystem can be more mature and more complete. And it is still something we should explore together. And also for some energy demand intensive areas, they have more potential to participate or to benefit from VPPs. On the other hand, maybe uh, something more difficult. It is in terms of the in terms of the market. How can we link the power market with the carbon market? It is still we still see a lot of space for improvement. We cannot uh link everything blindly of course we have to link it in a more logical way now we're focusing on low carbon development green development and we already fixed our uh, global goal but now we have to make the mechanism work thank you very much mr professor gong so what I feel is that with a higher share of new energy, renewables 
in the system. Uh, even those who are very advanced in this area, they still, they're still working on it. They still have space for improvement. So my next question, I would like to ask uh, Professor uh, Gnachon first and also Professor Kiefer, and then I'll turn to my colleagues, Chinese colleagues. Actually, Europe and also Australia have been some of the most important uh, reference models for China's power market. So if you can name two, let's say one to two lessons that China should learn from the Europe or Australia, either can be success or, or failure, whatever that you should think that you think are very important for, for China to understand more about, what, what would they be? So I think uh, maybe let's start with uh, Dr. Cooper as you gave a much higher rate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to choose two failures. Um, yeah. because there certainly are some in Australia. The first I would say is being a tr failure to get off coal and gas generation fast enough. Um, we're now, Australia's in quite a different situation to China. We have very old coal-fired power stations and a number of them are now failing. We had a turbine at the Calide power station in Queensland last year that blew up. Um, and that part of that generator is still offline. Uh, and I also think because the decarbonisation of the electricity sector has to go first in order to decarbonise so many other areas of the economy, particularly, obviously, electric vehicles, um, we've been slower than we could have um, to decarbonise and to... Um, and we haven't set a timetable, for example, for the closure of coal-fired power stations. Um, it's been very ad hoc policy there. And a second failure is really about not electrifying homes and businesses fast enough. So what we have in common with the Europeans is with um, the invasion of Ukraine um, Australian gas prices have been linked to international prices. And so we've had price shocks for consumers, particularly gas dependent businesses. And obviously if we'd electrified them before now, they wouldn't have the price shocks or be subject to those volatile prices. And we would have a huge amount of flexible demand um, that was available in the system. So that's okay. not only hot water, but also um, heat pumps um, as at an industrial level for industrial heating for things like food and beverage manufacturing and the like. Okay. Yeah. So how about from, from the Europe? Yeah. You are misunderstanding what I am saying. I am saying that because we trusted Russia as a supplier we cannot perform. And it was not a policy of the European Commission. European Commission President Barroso spent 10 years at European Commission to say, we cannot trust Russia, do not trust Russia, we cannot trust Russia, do not trust Russia. And he asked the member states, the countries, to build an independent gas supply with other countries, Iran, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan. By the way, <laughs> Kazakhstan and the others, you also have a supplier to China, because China is not considering that only Russia can supply. Many others are invited in a region. What we didn't do, that the mistakes, and this mistake was not made by the European Commission, but by the governments of countries. We've won being the leader, Germany, the Prime Minister, Schroeder. This Prime Minister was so close from Russian gas that still today is very close from Russian gas and still helping Russian gas to stay in the game. If we forget the story of Russian gas, what did the European market is correct. 
You remember the European market is very light. The European market is saying, in your country you do this, well, in other countries you do that, fine. But all countries will stay open to each other and all countries will acknowledge that for the short-term dispatch, we use the marginal price at European level. But you do what you want in your country, but short-term dispatch is made by the marginal price. This is so good, so effective, so impactful, that you will notice that in the reform proposed by European Commission, marginal pricing is kept. Many things are changed, but not marginal pricing. Because you remember that we use marginal pricing in EU to select the plants going to generate in the coming 30 minutes. But when we want, for example, adequacy, as said by Ms. Young, when we want adequacy, adequacy is arranged by the transmission system operators in a separated system. When we want to beef up renewables investment, we do it via support schemes, another system. So we have a system for renewable investments, a system for reliability adequacy, and a system to select the marginal plant. I think it's very pragmatic. And uh, I will say something a bit stupid, but I think that Chinese are very pragmatic. They are very brave and very pragmatic. You could do something similar. You have different provinces with different energy mix in the different provinces. And you can tell, well, OK, it is your energy mix, fine. But according to the capability of transmission between the provinces, well, this amount can be traded together at the national level. And uh, this national trade will uh, give more incentives to people going in the direction of the nation instead of the direction of the province. So I don't think we are so far from seeing in China things we already do. We use different wording. Eh? Uh, uh, we have very different ways of, of using wording, but in practice, we are not so far. Thank you. Then maybe Ms. Jiang, you could comment on what just had been said. Personally, I think our two experts are right. And what they are interested in, we are interested in. We talk about energy supply security design for the power market, all these questions are interconnected. So for the next step, we need to learn these lessons from other countries. We need to keep close communication with our experts. And Dr. Lee, can you please comment? Sorry, I had a problem of connection. Could you please repeat? Of course, after our two um, experts participated, the, uh, shared the lessons with us, I would like to hear your comments on what they just said. From your perspective, What do you think about what they just said? What can China learn from it? First of all, I think every country has its particular situation and has different resources. Generally speaking, the acceleration of decarbonization and diversification of supply sources 
the design of the future market. These are yes, very important topics, and their lessons are important for us to learn from. Recent years in China, we talk about acceleration of decarbonization to let coal phase out. However, if we want to use, uh, if we want to achieve dual carbon goal, we need to find the right pace for us. We need to have a good plan. We do need to accelerate the use of renewables, but at the same time, we cannot let our energy supply be impacted. So to let coal phase out, the concept is not wrong, but we need to ensure the capacity. So while we try to build a unified power market system, we need to make sure that everyone finds benefits from it. Thank you very much. Time is limited, but I do have a last question. We see that for Australia, we talk about the DER penetration in the consumers and the system is very developed. And today we see in China, there is also this trend. So I have a question for Dr. Cooper and Dr. Gong. What do you think is the role of consumer on energy resources in power decarbonization? And what are the enablers of the integration of these resources in the power system? Especially with Dr. Gong, we talk a lot, a lot about what we like to build VPPs in China. So I would like to know, are there other enablers we need to think about? So maybe we could start with Dr. Gong. Okay, first, we try to learn the example of Australia in the past. For example, how to replace certain energy use in the kitchen. So on the customer and consumers end, we see many good practices, but there is also a challenge. How can we make consumers accept the new way? In Australia, there had been regulations, obligations. Certain practices have become mandatory. For example, you need to install extra renewable panels or equipment. So that's what we are thinking about in China too. We need to have pilot projects to verify, for example, by the year of 2030, or even further, how can we deploy this kind of uh, VPPs? Secondly, everyone is interested in the benefits. In my PPT, I presented to you some information on this regard. For example, how could ancillary services suppliers contribute in this uh, system. And in different provinces, we have tried with our pilot projects and we had some very positive results. Now we are thinking about how to scale up this kind of project. We need to maybe multiply the size of certain VPPs. Besides, 
this new uh, we need to still work on these new models of profits on the consumer side on the commercial side we see how things works but we need to see how we can scale up and also we need to work on for example 5g stations how can we include them in the vpps so we need to develop new business models we're confident. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gong. So, Dr. Cooper. Thanks very much. When it was first proposed that household rooftop solar should have subsidies in the form of high feed-in tariffs, a lot of energy experts in Australia were appalled. They were like, there's no economies of scale. If we're going to subsidize renewables, it should all be at the large scale. What they forgot in that criticism is that when you have behind the meter resources, you're co-locating your generation with your load and potentially your storage, and you're using the distribution network and particularly the transmission network less. So it can be far more efficient and cost effective. Um, I think there are three types of enablers to make the most of distributed energy resources, whether that's in a virtual power plant or otherwise. The first set of enablers are really the technical ones. So not only um, dynamic operating envelopes, but Dr. Gong mentioned standards. So standards to make sure, for example, household appliances can be demand responsive and industrial appliances as well. So a whole range of technical enablers, then you've got to get the regulations right, and then also obviously the market, market settings, um, but you have to start with the technical, um, but all three of those are necessary. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, oh, time is limited to us. I do want to continue, but we have to stop here. Personally, I think from the very beginning, China always believed that we can succeed with efforts we made. But I think the international exchange is really important today because we all face, we all find ourselves facing the problem of energy supply issues. So we need to share. So here is the end of our discussion, panel discussion. So I give the floor back to Camille. Uh, thank you very much. And congrats, we are almost on time. So yeah, it's already the end of our webinar. So I'll try to conclude briefly. First of all, of course, I would like to thank our, again our co organizer, uh, RMI and EPTI, for the support and uh, input to the webinar. Uh, I think that in a very short time, we have managed to cover a lot of recent evolutions and perspectives on power markets and had a quite substantive discussion on what is needed to facilitate the uptake of renewables, but also taking into account uh, consumers. As you uh, were saying, we are quite confident that China uh, will achieve its goal of building a national unified um, power market system and will find its uh, own path to do so. And at the end, we, we stand ready to offer tools and policy recommendations for China to progress in that direction. And we are planning more activities and analysis in that sense in the coming months. Uh, thanks also to all our speakers, of course, for their excellent presentations and comments. Thanks for joining so early, so early here in France and so late over there in Australia. Presentation and um, the webinar recording will be made available in the, in the coming days on the IEA website. And yeah, finally, if you would like to continue the discussion and ask more questions, because we were quite limited on time today, please reach out to us. And I can't help but uh, strongly encourage you to go check out the recent publication from our organization, such as the excellent 
2023 in China Power Outlook by uh, RMI. And the IEA report that Pablo mentioned at the beginning on the, the unified power markets in China. So thank you all again for participating in this event. I hope we can meet again very soon in person in China and have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.